Dr. James King Land, International Advisor on Primary Care, President National Association of Primary Care United Kingdom, and Dr. Annapurna Sen, Health Protection Lead, North, North Ampho Stone Fire United Kingdom to kindly come on the stage, sir and ma'am. I also invite Dr. Brit Sharma, Consultant and Head of Department Gastroenterology, Indira Gandhi Medical College, Shimla, and Dr. Omesh Kumar Bharti, who is currently working as state epidemiologist with Himachal government. And recently, Dr. Omesh Bharti has been selected for Padma Shri Award 2019 Medicine Rabies by the Government of India. Thank you, dignitaries. I now hand over the mic to Dr. Brit Sharma to kindly conduct the session. Thank you. Now I will invite Dr. Anpurna Sen, uh, Health Protection Lead, North, North and Star, UK. Please. Good afternoon, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Bharti, and good afternoon, James. Good afternoon, my fellow professionals. Um, I'm so proud to be here in my motherland and doing a presentation. Thank you, Dr. Bharadwaj and the organization team for inviting us to deliver talk. Uh, I'm not going to talk anything special. You all are experts here. You all know what I'm saying. I'm only here to reinforce what is the need in the country. So I'll be talking about the antenatal and newborn screening program. So the title is Each Baby Counts and a Care Bundle for Reducing Birth Defects, Stillbirths, and Neonatal Deaths. Dr. James Kingsland is one of our co-authors, and I also acknowledge contribution from my senior a professor and head, uh, Dr. Mamta Dhaneria from Ujjain Medical College. So before I go ahead with the Indian context, I'll talk about the global context. The congenital anomalies, you all know, they are the structural, functional, and metabolic disorder present from birth. And they're rising up as an important cause of infant mortality in most of the countries, even where infant mortality shows significant reduction, like country of ours, India. 70% of these anomalies are preventable through the application of various cost-effective screening programs. According to the March of Dime Global Report on Birth Defects, globally we have 7.9 billion births. They occur annually with serious congenital defects, and 94% of these births occur in the middle and low income countries, and India belongs to one of them. According to Joint World Health, Health Organization, an MOD meeting report again, the birth defects account for 7% of all neonatal mortality, and 3.3 million under five deaths. Major anomalies include congenital heart defects, neural tube defects, and Down syndrome, hemoglobinopathies, G6PD deficiency, and these four cause 20% of infant mortality and are responsible for substantial number of childhood hospitalization. So the huge cost to the healthcare economy. Now, Indian context. In India, the birth defect prevalence varies from 61 
to 69.9 per thousand live births. Still a huge number for us. What are the risk factors which we haven't considered fully and haven't addressed them? One of them is maternal age at conception. In India, with the increasing education, there's a little delay in the marriage. Annual birth of Down syndrome babies are around 70, 37,000. And take, this calculation I have done, taking incidence of Down syndrome as 1.4 per thousand live birth. And this, I took it from, and this is called what? NFHS3. Incidence of Down syndrome is related to fertility status of older women, more than 35 years, which constitute around 17% of the fertile female population of the country. Again, I have taken that number from a family health survey. Based on the estimates published in NFHS3, around 5.26 million births occur annually in female age 35 to 49. 65% of these are of four or more order. These births are also at maximum risk for Down syndrome. Now, another thing is unplanned pregnancies and inadequate antenatal care. We have improved a lot, but we still have to walk miles and miles in antenatal care. No antenatal care means pregnancies not benefited from preventive strategies against congenital defects. According to the survey here again, 22.8% of pregnant female didn't receive any antenatal care. Again, one-fifth alarming numbers. And another one-third, that is 33%, receive any type of antenatal care at four months or even later. It's no, no use doing it because the genetic disorders and the congenital anomaly will well set in there and we'll have the complications. Then we also, medical conditions, which is non-communicable diseases or other pregnancy complications are, are other one of the factors. Consanguineous marriages in our population is one of the biggest factor. 14% of ever married women were related to their husband before their marriage. And 12% of these marriages were consanguineous marriages. The most common type of these marriages were with the first cousins. That is 9% of all the marriages. These marriages are more likely to have higher rate of postnatal mortality and higher rate of congenital malformations and genetic disorders. Another factor, parents carrier status of a genetic, genetic disorder. So the carrier frequencies for sickle cell hemoglobin ranges from 17 to 30% or more in the population. And the carrier frequency for beta thalassemia ranges from 0.3% to 15%. See the wide range. That for the milder form of thalassemia and from 15 to 18%, that is in the eastern part, that is for alpha thalassemia. Now, maternal nutritional sessions, we had a session on that, nutri nutritional status. Uh, in my opinion, it's unfortunate that maternal deficiencies of iodine and folic acid and other macro and micronutrient found to be associated with congenital anomalies, and still in India, more than half of the pregnant women are using inadequate iodized salt and are still anemic. Something needs to be done. Now another is pre and postnatal exposure to teratogens. Use of tobacco and smoking in pregnancy, use of alcohol, exposure to radiation, various categories of drug or substance misuse, and the biggest challenge inappropriate self-medication multiply the risk of congenital defects. What should we do as health authorities or the Department of Health? We should prioritize the prevention strategies. We have been talking about universal health coverage, and I did not see the adequate emphasis on prevention aspect. We were talking about the treatment of the medical model of the care. 
So antenatal and newborn screening services have not been given priority in this country. Maybe, I don't know, due to lack of resources, inadequate data, which is definitely there, on congenital anomalies, and insufficient number of, maybe again, because I'm not an expert to comment on that, maybe insufficient number of trained health personnel to deliver screenings. As India, it's a positive note, has significantly reduced the IMR, comes along with it, it has been seen, or in the evidence, it has been noticed that as the infant mortality will go down, the proportional deaths from congenital defects will rise up. So that, there's a reciprocal association. As suggested in MOD and WHO report, that 70% of the birth defects are preventable if we implement a suitable antenatal and newborn care and screening program for detection, care, and prevention of congenital diseases at the community level with the aim to maximize the chances of having healthy babies, then again, we can fly our flags high. Throughout the world, many countries have most cost-effective preventive and care strategies, and they have evaluated its success, and which can be localized and in India and can be implemented as well. Now, our recommendations to the health authorities, to medical professionals, people in power, that please enhance your current antenatal care pathway and develop antenatal and newborn screening standards for the population screening program. And in our opinion, antenatal and newborn screening standard should include risk assessment for fetal growth retardation, infectious diseases in pregnancy, fetal anomaly screening, sickle cell and thalassemia screening, newborn blood spot screening, newborn hearing screening, newborn physical examination, and screening for gestational diabetes. Now, this is a transformation for the country. So we have to develop a sustainable transformation. So the program design should be just based on these. It should have a shared goal because antenatal and newborn screening program is a multi-agency collaboration. Yeah, so it should be a shared goal. The program should be family friendly, safe, personalized and professional, and, and the wider thing, what we have to do in the system de design is we have to, first thing most important is sharing the data and the information, harnessing digital technology, we are talking, but we still have to do a lot. Reforming the payment systems. So one of the issues probably, if I may be, I may be wrong, but uh, as per my understanding, speaking to my colleagues here or classmates or seniors, that some of the labs may not have the pay facilities to do the testing, and they hesitate to deliver it because they do not know who they are going to invoice for the payment, how do I, they are going to get the funding from. So that is why we have to reform the payment system. Promoting good practice for safer care, so the training and education for the professionals, Improving prevention, so health education. Improving access to perinatal mental health services. Mental health service, still a stigma for us. Supporting local transformation. So it, it has to be a national program, but needs to be localized at the state level, at the district level, or maybe at a town level, because you simply cannot make at the top and drop it at the bottom. You have to localize it. Now, what should be the screening standards or the strategies, yeah? That, that all stakeholders or all the partners should have access to reliable and timely information about the quality of screening program. Data, again, data comes in every time. Data at local, state, and national level. Quality measures, I don't know how effective they are, Quality measures across the screening pathway without gaps and duplication. And another most important thing, a consistent approach across screening programs throughout the country. At the moment, I've been speaking to people, 
and it is inconsistent, inadequate. Some of them do something, the others do others. We don't have a national protocol for the screening. Programs should support health professionals and commissioners who can commission the service in providing a high quality screening program. And this should involve developing and reviewing the screening standards. We should review it annually or three, three years, whatever government decides, against which data is collected. So we'll have to evaluate our own performance data, which should be reported annually. And standards should provide a defined set of measures, that is KPI, or a key performance indicators, that service providers have to meet to ensure local services are safe and effective. Another thing which is required here is setting up an appropriate quality assurance process to check that all the standards within the strategy are met. QA should cover the entire screening pathway from identifying who is eligible through to the test, to the referral, and the treatment where required and appropriate. So it should be the complete care pathway. So quality assurance for complete care pathway. So what should it include? Uh, if I say you include all the 16 indicators, it may be very difficult. So the program can be implemented in phases, but our recommendation, what can it include? So one is a fetal anomaly screening program. So it should recommend all eligible pregnant women they are offered screening to assess the chance of the baby being born with Down syndrome, that is trisomy 21. And I think in Edwards and Patel is not that prevalent in India, if I am right. So if we have to initiate, we should initiate with uh, T21 or trisomy 21 or a Down syndrome, or maybe with the quadruple test. The test of choice for both singleton and twin pregnancies should be the first trimester and combined screening, so the ultrasound associated with the ultrasound scan. The choice for women accepting quadruple test for Down syndrome should be offered. When the offer of screening is accepted, we should do ultrasound and the biochemical test hand in hand, not separately, and it should be done within 11 to 14 weeks of pregnancy. That is the most suitable time. A second scan for fetal anomalies should take place optimally between 18 to 20 plus six weeks. I don't know what is the MTP, um, I mean, uh, the protocol here. When, when is the last deadline where the me medical termination of pregnancy can be done? But in my knowledge, probably it's a 20 weeks. If am I, am I right? I don't know. The timing of the scans allows for further diagnostic test if required and enables women time to consider decisions about continuing with their pregnancy if, despite of knowing they have a child with genetic abnormality, if they still want to carry on. So they should be given that choice to decide as well. Sickle cell and thalassemia screening program. So this should screen for genetic carriers for sickle cell, thalassemia, and other hemoglobin disorders. Sickle cell disease, thalassemia, and hemoglobin disorders. It should offer screening to all pregnant women, fathers-to-be, where antenatal screening shows the mother is a genetic carrier, and all newborn babies as part of the newborn blood spot screening program. Infectious diseases in pregnancy screening. I'm well aware that India does a lot. They are doing HIV testing. They are doing VDRL testing, if I'm right. Uh, so, but the recommendation is that the national policy should consider to offer and recommend screening for HIV, hepatitis B, which is probably not included in the ANC program, and syphilis, probably it's not a problem in India, but can be tested in high-risk women, and sexually transmitted diseases. Some women may choose not to be screened or accept screening for some one or the other conditions. When the offer is declined, it's our responsibility as screening coordinators to re-offer it to them at 20 weeks of gestation. High-risk women should also be screened for TOTCH, toxoplasmosis, 
rubella, cytomegalovirus, herpes, and other virus. Hepatitis B positive mother, the most important bit, is the hepatitis B positive mother should be referred in a timely manner for a specialist assessment. And so the treatment can start in time. Newborn blood spot screening, many, nine rare conditions. But uh, in my opinion, it can be again implemented in phases because last six conditions are the inher inherited metabolic diseases. So probably to initiate, we can start with sickle cell disease, cystic fibrosis. I was reading a paper that the incidence of cystic fibrosis in India is going up and congenital hypothyroidism, which is a problem. Now, newborn and infant physical examination screening program. The newborn and infant physical examination screening program should screen newborn babies within 72 hours of birth. And then once again, between six to eight weeks for conditions relating to their heart, hips, that is for hip dysplasia, eyes, and testicles. Screened for all four components in a male child and three components in a female newborn. Six to eight week screen is necessary as some conditions appear, appear later than 72 hours. This is, I have taken it from our NHS screening program this is the timeline, antenatal and newborn screening timeline, optimum time for testing. And this is the complete pathway and all the screening program and how uh, pregnant women from the preconception up to the perinatal phase travels through the screening program. I think it's not very visible probably. Uh, I don't know whether you all get the slides, if you get the slides. You can read it. In summary, India has a high congenital anomaly rate, and these anomalies have significant impact on countries' neonatal mortality rate. Evidence suggests that 70% of it is preventable. The word preventable, we can avoid it. Its vast population is subject to a number of intrinsic risk factors affecting birth anomalies, such as I have already spoken, unplanned pregnancy, consanguineous marriages, high carrier rate, poor maternal nutrition, inadequate coverage of antenatal care. The country has improved significantly in its maternal and child health services. However, still, there is no government-funded antenatal and newborn screening program. The authors advocate that country should create a national antenatal and newborn screening program to detect and manage specific condition in a timely manner. The word timely manner is so important for safer pregnancies and childbirth. To conclude my presentation, fully functioning national program to risk assess fetal growth restriction as well as screening for fetal anomalies infectious diseases, sickle cell and thalassemia in pregnant women, and screening newborns for newborn blood spots, hearing, as well as infant physical examination, will complement the ambitions of universal health care and the national health protection mission. A national strategy, a national strategy is a requirement, definitely, with standards and key performance indicators, and it will warrant it's consistent impl implementation across the country. At the moment, maybe then states are deciding their own, taking their own decisions. So we need a national policy like a guideline for its consistent implementation. The strategy, strategy should include commissioning as well as operational plan. And you'll say, why commissioning? Because if one of the hospital doesn't have the facilities to provide all screening, they can at least commission, commission alternate provider, and there should be an arraignment in the strategy so that there's no barrier for them for commissioning the provider in delivering the service. Allocating adequate resources and funding in the program for further improving the quality of maternal 
and child health care. We have improved a lot, but we still have to go miles. Until it develops, and again, I say that here, my recommendation, until it develops into a national program, screening can be implemented using commissioning arrangements with alternate providers. It may be a public-private partnership, yeah? Mo and mobilizing resources from the current allocation for the Aishman, from the Aishman Bharat scheme. Thank you very much for listening to me. Any questions? Very welcome. Thank you, ma'am. If there is any question from the audience, yes, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Mahesh Devanani. I'm from PGI Chandigarh. Thank you very much for this insightful presentation. And I was a bit intrigued uh, for antenatal. No one can deny the benefit of antenatal screening, especially for Down syndrome. My question is that what is the you know, future course of action once it is you know, diagnosed? Is it just the abortion? Because I don't, I don't see there is any treatment once you diagnose antenatally that there is a Down syndrome fetus. And worldwide, there is a debate should we allow abortion for Down syndrome or not? In India, the medical termination of pregnancy is allowed till 20 weeks. And even it is debatable many times whether Down syndrome uh, fetus can be aborted legally or not. And the Supreme Court of India in a 26-week pregnancy actually denied this kind of a abortion. So I'm not sure what is the f you know, f uh, f futility of such kind of a screening when we have no treatment for it. Hello, hello. Yeah, sorry. Um, very valid and very good questions. Uh, the offering Down genetic screening or Down syndrome in a timely manner is important. One, hello. is it breaking? Is it okay? Can you hear? Yeah. Is it important because it gives an opportunity or offers an opportunity to a mother to, desi to decide whether she wants medical termination of pregnancy or not. If she accepts, that yes, I do want, then we should, as a medical professional, offer it to her. And if she says no, we should respect her wishes as well. Uh, we are saying do it in a timely manner because uh, in, in the country I live, that's United Kingdom, that's a, there's a law for medical termination, and that is 20 plus six days, that is beyond 21 days until if it's a medical complication, they don't allow MTP, medical termination of pregnancy. So that is why. But in this opinion, it gives mother the freedom or a choice to decide whether she wants to keep the baby or wants a medical termination of pregnancy. That's, that's the main thing. Yes, we can't do anything, but if we identify it early, the system can be better prepared to manage that case. Yeah, thank you. But then there are legalities involved. I think uh, those needs to be sorted out because different countries might have different kinds of them. And yes. in India also, there is no clear-cut uh, guidelines. Guideline yes. On yes. This. So thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Now I'll in invite Dr. Umesh Bharti, who has recently been awarded with the Padma Shri on his work on rabies. Yeah. Now he will explain how he has changed the management of rabies in the primary health, uh, primary health care level. That omission needs. First of all, my thanks to IAPSM Con for inviting me here. Uh, before I uh, go to what, what topic has been assigned to me, I would uh, thank uh, Dr. Annapurna Sen for her uh, insightful uh, talk. And Madam, in India, like you are saying we, we, we don't uh, continue with the, uh, with the screening programs. So I would give you one, just one example of Himachal Pradesh. So uh, when I was state blood transfusion officer in Shimla, I found that many, uh, some of the children died of thalassemia. So I requested my government uh, that children, some children have died of thalassemia. Please uh, have a screening program for thalassemia. You have given a battery of tests, uh, new war nine uh, screening test and um, uh, uh, prenatal uh, pre test and uh, no uh, antenatal tests. So I would just uh, this one example. 
So I went to government and said, uh, you start a thalassemia screening program. I was told that thalassemia runs around, see, Lahore, Gujarat, and uh, Punjab belt. So there is no thalassemia in, in Himachal. So I told them, sir, I have seen a child dying of thalassemia. Another child is uh, very, uh, almost uh, uh, very sick. So they didn't agree to this. So I made a uh, protocol for thalassemia screening in Himachal Pradesh. What I, why I'm saying this, this, I thought very important, because here comes the role of the medical colleges. Unless you generate a data, nobody, no policy maker would agree. So I made a protocol, I sent it to the National Health Mission, and it uh, got approved from there. And now uh, I, have to, uh, I uh, have to prove that it is there. So what we did, we did a uh, um, random sampling of 20, uh, we sorted, uh, uh, selected 20 colleges, young um, boys and girls of the colleges, 18 to 25 years old. And then we screened them for uh, uh, thalassemia carrier status. And to, to, the, to my surprise, the thalassemia carrier status in Himachal Pradesh was found to be 2.6%, which translates into almost 2 lakh people carrying uh, no, a thalassemia uh, carrier gene. So after this presentation to the government, then government agreed, okay, we will sanction you 6 crore rupees to install machines for thalassemia screening in medical colleges. So very, very difficult to make government to act. So uh, this, is, this is my request to all of you people in the medical colleges that nobody would agree to do nine screenings, do 10 screenings, unless you give them data. And to give data, you have to research. You have to go to the people. You have to, uh, you have to come out with the data that, yes, we need this screening, that screening. So this is what uh, my, uh, this is why I was very much interested to say a few words. And now, uh, very soon, we would start a thalassemia screening in Himachal Pradesh after this study. So these studies are very important, and publications are very important. Uh, and one more thing, ma'am, uh, like you said, the health and wellness centers, I think this screening should be linked up to that level. So that not even a single girl or child is missed up to the health and wellness center. So not only health and wellness center should be for preventive, promotive, and other services, it should be uh, for screening services also. So I don't know whether, I don't think that health and wellness uh, centers have this concept of screening in, built in. So I would like the chair to give this recommendation on, on our behalf that health and wellness center should also include the screening of you know, antenatal mother and new, neonates so that the, the disease is uh, caught in its early, you know, and uh, the treatment is given in, time, in timely fashion. So uh, I'm very delighted like, uh, to share with you that at least PSM person has been given a Padma Shri award this year, which is a very unique, uh, unbelievable thing I would, I would like to share. So uh, friends, uh, uh, if we see rabies is a problem of villages, and I have seen people dying of rabies in villages for want of prophylaxis. Live at our topic is primary health care. Not only uh, for want of uh, prophylaxis, people die uh, in the villages. They die because they are ignorant of the first, first aid, what to do. Simple 15-minute wound wash and a simple antiseptic application can save up to 50% to 60% people before we refer them to the, to the, to the higher centers for, for vaccination. And uh, I would like to share with you that in Himachal, we are running, you know, 90 pooling centers. Pooling center mean, if anybody is bitten anywhere in Simla, they would send the person to either to IGMC or to Ripon Hospital for vaccination. So we don't do vaccination everywhere. So this has made our uh, while sharing strategy of vaccine and immunoglobulin uh, among the patients. So that, that's how we bring the cost down. As you know, we, have, we are the only state in the country or maybe in the world to implement new WHO guidelines that has been released in April 2018. There are a few centers like J&K are telling me, some uh, Uttarakhand center is telling us that they have just radically started do, uh, uh, following WHO guidelines. So we are the people who are following it thoroughly throughout the state. And our cost of prophylaxis is 10 to 100 times lower than it used to be earlier. And earlier, the percentage of coverage was very, very less, 50 to 60%. Now it is almost 90 to 
and so much so that the last two years we have not seen any case of rabies in, in Himachal Pradesh due to this implementation new guidelines. So I think uh, uh, as all of you know that we give three intradermal injections on day 0, 3, 7 after wound care and wound wash and antiseptics uh, and we give uh, uh, in infiltration of rabies immunoglobulin only into the wound. There is no muscle component either in the vaccine or in the immunoglobulin. So vaccine we give intradermal and immunoglobulin we give only in the in the in the wound. And sometimes the quantity of immunoglobulin that is given in the wound is just a minuscule, just one drop, two drops. Suppose there is a nail injury by a monkey, like so many tourists. So earlier we used to give just one drop in the in the in the wound, in the nail uh, injury, and rest two vials we used to give intramuscular. So which causes huge reaction, huge pain, and huge cost to the patient. So I think with this new, new WHO guideline, I'm very happy that uh, our work done in a small government hospital, district hospital, has been accepted by WHO. So though we have, uh, we have passed through a lot of rigorous uh, uh, scrutiny by WHO experts, so now when this India has taken this lead, I want, uh, my sincere request is that you take this message of you know, low-cost prophylaxis up to the primary health center level in each of your states by doing more and more CMEs, by doing more and more awareness campaign, not only among the public, but among the doctors, how to do it, how to, do, how to give correct you know, intradermal uh, vaccination, how to correctly infiltrate the wound to cover its entire surface up to till the depth of the, uh, depth of the wound. So you would be surprised, people from Lahol Spiti used to go to you know, 200 kilometers to Kasoli for, for uh, getting uh, rabies immunoglobulins. We have, a, we have some of the landlocked areas like Dodra Kaur. Dodra Kaur earlier used to be a PSC, so a lot of um, beer attack there in Dodra Kaur. So people used to carry uh, the patients on their shoulders to, uh, to cross the you know, uh, passes, snow-laden passes, to the other side for rabies prophylaxis. And now I, I have been to Dodra Kaur, we have this immunoglobulin and vaccine up to the PSC level, the remotest of the PSC, we have immunoglobulin and uh, uh, rabies vaccine. That's how we have, uh, we are very uh, soon going to get this distinction of rabies free state maybe in the country very soon. So, thank you. Now I'll invite Dr. James K. Kingsland, he's international advisor on primary care, president of national association of primary care in the United Kingdom. Dr. James, please. Many thanks and good afternoon, everybody, esteemed colleagues. Um, Dr. Sharma, thank you. And uh, Dr. Barty so eloquently has said what I was going to say perfectly in uh, the presentation, which is going to revisit a little bit for those of you who are here this morning about the, um, the purpose and place of primary care in universal health coverage, but particularly uh, my colleague Dr. Sen was giving a practical way of delivering a largely primary care type service, largely thought of as a hospital based service, but the health and wellness centres, the development which is um, uh, started but I think struggling a little bit is a perfect example of how this could be developed. So I want to build on that theme and thank you Dr. Barty for, for putting that. Just by way of introduction, um, I'm still practicing as a family physician in the northwest of England and a professor of primary care in the University of Central Lancashire. But um, uh, this talk is also going to just touch on primary care's place in disaster medicine. So quite a sprawling talk. But um, we are doing a, a program of um, disaster management support in India. And my role is an international advisor uh, within that program on the, the place of primary care. So if you bear with me, this is um, a number of issues. I'm going to start with uh, just a, a, re a refresh of uh, UHC, the role and purpose of primary care, a little bit about primary care in disaster medicine, because of course the Sendai framework, uh, that the first, I think the first national disaster management plan for India was launched in June of 2016 by, by the Prime Minister. Um, and so a little bit about the, the Sendai framework and then some practical solutions building on uh, how, how the health and wellness centres particularly could provide a comprehensive community-based service over the, the time 
that uh, the Eichmann Barrett programme is, uh, is describing. So I'll start with, I thought I'd start with a quiz question. So um, no prize, but anyone who that, that is? Ooh. This, this is a, a 2,000 year old photograph before cameras were invented. I'll, I'll come back to that if you don't know who that is, but um, it's about why universal health coverage is, is so difficult. Um, one of the things we, we struggle with in healthcare systems is organisational memory. And we often try harder at what's already failed. We don't necessarily reinvent the wheel. I had a great term from when I was in the US recently. We, we try and reinvent the flat tyre before we at least fix the puncture. So there's nothing new except what, this, what has been forgotten was something from um, Marie Antoinette. There's nothing new under the sun. What has been will be before. It's from the Christian Bible, Ecclesiastes. But interestingly, on universal health coverage, which we're saying is a, a new concept, this was an interesting quote uh, I found from the chap in the photograph. Of course, it is in the photograph on the, uh, the first page. Anyone know who he is yet? So it's just over 2,000 years ago that uh, Emperor Ashoka was looking to get universal health coverage. So it, it, it's a thesis that was about time that we did something about it, and I think there is a way of delivering a programme. I um, always have to give references. These are the, the references for that particular attempt at the ethical responsibility, which we all know is, is a requirement for universal he health coverage. And it's interesting looking at the most recent timeline, WHO, Health for All by the end of 2000, 19 years ago. So by the millennium, we had the, devel the development goals, which were supposed to be delivered by 2015. Having not delivered those, we've had the SDGs, which are going to be delivered by 2030. We do hope, with the refreshment of uh, some of the, um, uh, the programmes, that uh, we will get universal health coverage and reaffirm health for all. This morning I was talking about the declaration of Alma Arta in 1978, which was the first time we started to talk about health for all. Forty years later, we've had the declaration of Astana, which is about primary care for all. And whilst we've made some, we have made some uh, great steps, I think there's a case of how do we deliver universal health coverage? And do we need to even revisit uh, a 70-year-old definition of um, the WHO's health in the context of today's society. Because when I look at health from okay, the, 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 the UK, the second bullet point, I think people who have got a home or a shelter, a job and some income, and a social network or a friend are pretty healthy. And if you've got a home, a job and a friend, or an income, a shelter, and a network, I noticed that you can deal with your non uh, NCD, your diabetes, far better than if you haven't got those. And so I start to wonder about the delivery of a care system that should look at the wider determinants of health. I'm going to just touch on the environmental and, and climate um, health in, in disaster medicine. But these are well known that if we get these right, and I think there's a great place for the health and wellness centres to look at these issues which can lead to a much healthier society than if we are always focused on the higher complex, higher cost drug treatment interventions. So maybe we should be saying uh, for our definition for the, this millennium, the, uh, the WHO, that the state of uh, complete physical, mental, social, environmental well-being uh, to include the absence of determinants of disease. Because certainly in my practice now with with these, if people have got uh, good nutrition, good sanitation, if they exercise, they don't smoke, they don't drink too much, um, they have a much better chance of living a healthy life and to a good age than uh, if these are not in place. I make no apology about this slide because too often we use the term, terminology, but internationally we mean different things. What we've tried to do is, is define uh, primary care on an international basis. In the UK, we talk of it as a level in the system. So primary care is the family physician service that is community-based, our community pharmacy, sensory services where eye care and hearing services are, are delivered in a community setting, uh, and dental care. 
But I think it's, it's better to think of it as a, an approach, a functional aspect of delivering a service. And therefore, there's four consistent features that need to be brought into a primary care system. And if this primary care system is going to deliver um, uh, or, or be the main focus of delivering UHC. So it's the first contact for all new care. Therefore, it needs to be well spread throughout a country. It needs to be in areas that are remote, difficult to reach. And the health and wellness centres are a, a great opportunity to, to do that. It's a, a focus on a holistic approach. It's the person who is suffering with diabetes, not the diabetic. So it's uh, not disease focused, looking at the holistic needs of an individual. And it's comprehensive in as much that from, from birth to, to grave and from the, the, the presentations that are common in populations should be delivered and episodes of care completed by a multi-professional team in a community setting. But of course, it's really important then, if that is the first contact care, the right people then are uh, selected to have hospital services only when they are needed. And we know certainly in um, international uh, hospital services that there is a significant proportion of people being managed by expertise that is not required for their particular care. So the Astana Declaration of October last year reaffirmed that uh, primary health care for all was probably the main focus within this care for all, within um, uh, universal health coverage. Uh, Forty years after the declaration, I was saying of the Alma Arta, we've made some strides, but still there's a significant proportion of the world and lots struggle with developing community-based services and a comprehensive service. So we do know now that uh, UNICEF and the WHO are going to focus on helping govern governments and civil society to, um, to, to act on this. The evidence behind primary health care and its, its provision, we think that 85 to 90 percent of all common care needs within any society in any country can be managed in a primary care setting with the right skill mix of team um, and managed in primary care. We've got, uh, this is based on UK data, but it does translate internationally and certainly has been managed uh, to, to look in the uh, 11 OECD countries, that where you have accessible primary care, particularly family physicians, you significantly reduce the, the strain on ED, ED departments, and particularly you can re reduce costs in a healthcare system. So a 1% increase in the proportion of patients accessing a family physician can reduce scheduled care in hospitals by 2%. So for every 1% increase in the proportion, a 2% reduction in scheduled care requirements in the hospital sector. Um, I've, I've put some of the evidence there. This is just to say there is strong evidence behind primary care as a vital part, the cornerstone of any healthcare system. Barbara Starfield, uh, God rest her, she, she died in 2011 but was a paediatrician working at the, the John Hopkins, uh, became a public health physician but did a lot of the research to demonstrate the importance of a community-based comprehensive system that's accessible to populations and demonstrating that the supply of primary care physicians working in a, in a community is, di is directly associated with improvements of inequalities. And conversely, specialist groups actually uh, have been demonstrated to increase health inequalities, albeit providing an expert service. But systems with this generalist uh, approach uh, improve access, equity, and particularly drive down cost per case or cost, uh, capita costs. Again, this is just reaffirming that um, the international evidence is that countries with strong primary health care systems have better outcomes for patients. They uh, lower inequalities in these outcomes and have these lower per capita costs. I know it's been exhaustive, but hopefully it proves the point that when we are uh, developing or reforming care, this is a really important part to focus on. And um, we were fortunate to uh, meet with um, the Union Health Minister just uh, yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, and talking about how some of this evidence can support 
the, 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 the Irishman Barrack, but particularly the uh, focus on developing the health and wellness centres to deliver a comprehensive primary care solution for India. Um, within that primary care, you may have heard of the triple aim of healthcare, the IHI in, in the States started to say that any healthcare system, you need to identify a population for whom you can improve the health and well-being, uh, as well as the uh, experience of, of the individual. You need to reduce per capita costs of care, and particularly, uh, we're finding that with the strains on, on the provision, the improving the experience of pro providing care after being uh, incorporated into any healthcare reform. And this is consistently recognised as the, the, the quadruple aim for any healthcare development. And, and then building a service that uh, is linked to the health and wellness centres. This is international evidence of what people value from a service. The accessibility, um, the localness of a service, the, the continuation of care, the communication that's provided by a multi-professional team, uh, the inter, uh, personal attributes of care, as well as the, 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 the technical competence, but a range of on-site services, some of the services for maternal and um, child health that uh, Anna has been uh, uh, describing and we would recommend would be part of the development of these health and well wellness centres. Just to put this into context for the reforms that are currently uh, uh, in, in India, um, it's interesting that uh, we talk about the, the challenges on any healthcare system um, from the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, Human Development Index. The last uh, 29 years have, uh, have shown there's uh, an increase in life expectancy. The average life expectancy now is 68.5, so people are living longer, but often longer with complex disease, putting more strain on healthcare provision. So with this uh, aging population, I'm always a bit uh, perplexed by some colleagues who say our problem is we've got an aging population. That's something we should be celebrating. But we do know that within that population that uh, uh, there is the greater risk of uh, long-term conditions. With the in, in, importing of new technologies, the digital uh, health requirements that um, many populations are expecting now, uh, that there's got to be a dynamic and progressive approach. So there may be opportunities still to reform the, um, the India's focus on delivering the, their health challenge. So I would still suggest that some of the investment improving access to primary health care uh, is really important against this expanding demand and will be very difficult to deal with that demand in the secondary and tertiary care sectors alone. So the, um, the health and wellness centres, the 153,000 that are planned in a relatively short time, um, my last understanding is that there's, there's uh, around 7,000 that have been designated largely within two states, so there's a, a big program to deliver that. But our evidence is that if you can define a population in which you can have a one-team, multi-professional team approach, then the right size for population health management, and I'm going to give a, 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 an overview of a program we've developed for the UK. It's being um, used in, in, in other um, OECD countries as a principle, but population health management based on a size where you can do the, the analytics but also provide the right team is somewhere between 30 and 50,000. So our suggestion is that in the first instance, if you're looking at improved population health management, the focus on early detection, prevention, some of the, uh, the programs that Anna was talking about, that would be the right population size to start with, and maybe the health and wellness centres should be focused on that size population, which would mean that um, India would need, functionally, about 30,000 of these rather than 153,000 in, in the first instance, and then probably get the satellite services around these hubs that could provide extended primary care, first contact service, and some of the diagnostics, the early detection, and the programs in maternal and uh, child care. Um, so it's, it's a solution to look at uh, the numbers that could be developed, because it's going to be a big challenge to get 153,000 functional in the time that has been 
um, outlined by the government. Probably just a final thing to say, therefore, because um, every healthcare system I've ever visited always uh, cites that they haven't got enough resource. This morning I was saying it's, it's a difficult allocation because within public services spend, there's this paradox of people not wanting to pay more tax, the government still having to fund a whole range of public services but often having to make service cuts to fund others. Uh, but is it the case that sometimes it's not that we don't have the, the, the enough money, we just make the wrong allocation. And again, there's good evidence that a, a small investment in developing a community-based primary care system can have huge returns on that relatively small investment. So just a touch on how primary care can help in disaster medicine as well. And I'll rattle through this, but um, again, the, only the, uh, the fifth bullet point based on this background is that whilst disaster management is always thought on emergency care and emergency doctors, the disaster cycle has a really important part for primary health care, particularly in the preparedness and the recovery. So there is a growing understanding that primary health care is very important for effective um, emergency management, particularly during in the recovery phase and the risk reduction and preparedness. The Sendai framework delivered in 2015, um, which uh, all UN uh, uh, governments have, have, have accepted. Of the four priorities, again, I'm just going to quickly look at the four priorities. Priority four is the one that is largely focused on primary health care, the building back better. After a disaster has hit, the recovery phase can be many years where there is mental health problems, as well as the people who are already suffering with long-term conditions, NCDs, who have difficulty accessing medicines, have difficulty continuing uh, maintenance of their care in this post-disaster time. So the Building Back Better programme is largely focused on strengthening primary care. Again, this is um, just about the provision in the disaster risk reduction, uh, and probably, a, a, again, not to talk through the, the bullet points, but it's making the point that without the, the uh, primary care physicians involved in the disaster medicine cycle, it is difficult to deliver the Sendai framework. And so we are putting together a programme linked with um, at the start some philanthropic investment through the Rotary, now supported by Public Health England, uh, a number of academic institutions across India, some academic in institutions in England, to build a programme of training and development for disaster management. And we have um, four active centres. We are uh, coming back as a team in two weeks' time to do some education and training, both in emergency care, but also in the development of family physicians in the disaster cycle. Um, I'm going to slip through these because I think I'm going to be... Um, running out of time, and I just want to just touch on um, a concept, therefore, we call the primary care home. It could well be a, a health and wellness centre, which we've been building on the best of traditional general practice, but recognising that, as I was saying earlier, the wider determinants of health need a very different approach, a, a different team approach to the needs of this changing demo demographic, changing expectation, uh, and the ability to provide different types of care through digital technology. So we're saying that should we have a service, which we're calling general practice at the moment, the, the primary care home concept, it's not a great term, but we're saying it's the home for the extended care of, the, of an individual in their community, the home for the team that does the work, and the home for the data, the data that is held on the individual, the, 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 the care record. And it's the right place to do it, because as I was saying earlier, 80 to 90 percent of all health care needs can be delivered successfully and safely within a community setting. So we're saying it's the, the home for extended skills um, and particularly the four characteristics that I think are transferable uh, across um, uh, health economies and particularly the size of population. If we're doing whole population health management, the, the focus on personalised care but also the analysis of a population's health need in terms of preventative early detection uh, as well as, as curative treatments, 
delivered by the right team. So looking at the, the care needs of diverse populations, you need family physicians certainly, community nursing, uh, uh, professionals allied to medicine, but also social carers, third sector workers, voluntary care, other types of care support workers, um, uh, social prescribers, a, a range of things that can work as one team. And we've done a lot of work to map uh, the, the cognitive level at which teams work and could be functional as one team and map that back onto demand, not only just in, in England, but in other healthcare systems. And there is a consistency about the teams that can work as one team between 100 to 200 people mapped back onto a population size of 30 to 50,000. Time won't allow me to go into the detail, but there is this growing sense that this 30 to 50,000 population size, you can do good analytics, um, population health management in a way that leads to preventative care. And again, Anna was talking about some of the prevention in, in paternal health and the size of population where you could be responsive and have team-based care is around 50,000. And looking at the population of, of India, that's where uh, the 30,000 health and wellness centres with these characteristics could provide a responsive care and probably um, uh, a high return for the investment that the government is making. And just say team-based working, because uh, in my training, uh, by the end of my uh, undergraduate training, I was trained as an individual who knew everything and absolutely everything had to come through the, the physician before anyone else could deal with a patient. We've got very good evidence, particularly on um, an outcomes. This is uh, NHS research, but I think it does translate, is that team-based working does produce better outcomes for patients Indeed, lower mortality rates, reduced error rates, rather than working as individuals, and particularly um, teams that are formed through affinity as opposed to uh, teams that don't have any sense of ownership, are uh, developed through transactions, or work in different institutions and only occasionally come together. This pseudo team actually can produce worse outcomes for patients. So the team-based care, again, this is just to say where we've got our spread to. We've got about 21% of the population covered now with this, uh, this programme going from our individual pr uh, general practices to the primary care home, an organisation looking after 50,000 people that is focusing more on prevention as much as treatment. So we've, we've um, got a programme that is now looking as, and now mandated to cover the whole of England uh, before looking at the, the uh, uh, spread across the UK. And just say what one of these places look like. Uh, this is the sort of facility. And again, I just thought I'd finish by showing a few uh, of my hometown photographs. But we, we can, from this sort of facility, deliver maternal care. We do a lot of child, child health surveillance, minor surgery. There's physiotherapies working out of here. We have eye care. We have a, a range of services where finished episodes of care show that we can do this at a per capita cost of around um, 100 pounds per year for first access. There are fees for service, uh, there are extra costs in it, but uh, for a fixed allowance per capita of a, only a, 100 pounds, we can deliver comprehensive care to that individual annually. And it's in this sort of facility um, with consulting rooms, there's a strange chap who still does some um, healthcare de delivery. Uh, with expert nursing care, diagnostics, scanning facilities, uh, treatment areas, which have demonstrated uh, a massive reduction. And this is the sort of team which includes some secondary care uh, services, but within here, with nursing, physiotherapists, pharmacists, um, social care workers are part of a one-team approach which delivers an expanded range of care so has a significant act, as, uh, impact on secondary care services. And this is just to say we, uh, are again, very uh, NHS orientated, but we are measuring the impact in terms of health economics as well, where we're reducing costs in uh, the, the secondary care sector and having significant impact on uh, ED services and patient satisfaction, experience of care, and particularly recruitment and retention. This team-based approach, uh, as the final thing, is keeping people um, retained in service, returning to service, where we've got, uh, as many international healthcare systems have got, difficulty with supply of the workforce. 
this does seem to be bringing an enjoyment into practice uh, at, at that sort of level. At that point, Mr Chairman, hopefully that gives a, a brief overview. I know it covered a, a, a lot, but I think there is some things within that that are transferable to the reform in India at the moment, and particularly the, the, the need for a strong primary care sector based around the health, health and uh, wellness centre agenda. Thank you. Thank you, James, for your excellent talk. So, if there is any question. Uh, good evening, Cheers. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing team for giving me this opportunity to have a deliberation with you rather than a question with regard to focus on primary health care in India. Sir, so what I perceive in India, there was used to be a concept of family doctor at every home. Just what you used to say, it's our family doctor. But in past two, three decades, that has changed altogether. Now the focus is on who is your specialist doctor. So this change needs to be done at the societal level. How this can be addressed at societal level that a ground man who is going to seek health seeking treatment from a primary care physician does not need to be shifted to a tertiary care center at, at his mindset. Uh, if I am able to explain my thing, are you getting my point? How it can be done to, at societal level? Because in India, the rapid mobilization of uh, workforce from the rural centers to the urbanization, that thing has altogether gone. There are no family doctors available at the urban centers. They are looking for treatment only at the tertiary care centers. So how it can be done and how did it happen in UK? Were there any some restrictions that you cannot visit from a primary health care to a tertiary care without any referral? Or was it at societal level? There are many determinants to this thing. It is a very broader issue. But please, if you can throw some light upon that. Thank you so much. Yeah, yes, and a really, um, really important question. Um, the it's a slow incremental process. It's got to start everywhere from undergraduate training. We train most doctors internationally in a, a hospital-based... Is this, is this um, on yeah. again? In, in a hospital-based uh, sector, so we have doctors coming out expecting to work in hospital. When you've had a history of that, it's very difficult to change their outlook to, do, to pr 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 providing a, a community-based service. If there has been a, a trend of people using hospital services as their first contact, to change societal expectation and building a quality service and a safe service in the community which is accessible um, is, is a slow incremental process but um, I think historically the UK has always had a training program a postgraduate training program in family physicians which I think is really important as well which changes attitudes but I think it's going to be an incremental process first of all providing a a comprehensive service which has a quality and safety recognized by local populations who want then to have that as their first contact <coughs> care and the, the, the community or, or the, um, the, the health carers who are trained not only as undergraduates but postgraduates in community medicine which is, is very different to hospital based, based services. Uh, thank you sir. To add upon that, uh, can this session and uh, our respectable chairpersons can a message can be given that family medicine should be an integral part of medical curriculum? Th because that thing is lacking. Although we are having community medicine as a subject, but the importance of family medicine, family doctor plus community medicine together bring us, can bring a societal change. If you could appreciate it, please bring forth some recommendation to the government of India that it should be made an integral part of the medical curriculum which particularly focus on family doctor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gopal, for your nice comments and suggestion. Any other question? If there is no question, then I close this. Sir, I am Dr. Omar from Department of Community Medicine, Government Medical College. I have a question for the sir. In our setup, 
how we can change the mindset of the people. They are coming from, going from primary health care to state forward to tertiary care also. It's the same question what he's asking, but I'm asking a different way. That's how we can change the minds of the people because they don't trust the primary here so much in, in this setup, in our setup. They straightforwardly went to the uh, tertiary care. So how we can change, may build a trust in the people? I think it's going to be multiple ways. Um, first of all, to gain the experience of a quality service that's built within a community se sector that is accessible. Uh, financial flows have to change as well so that um, there is uh, incentives to contact first care in a community setting. Uh, as I was saying before, it's, it's going to be a slow incremental process, but it's about building a, a safe and extensive service that communities start to recognize, as a colleague was saying, is my nurse, my family physician, my physiotherapist, that's, uh, that the mindset change, but I think it's the experience of a, a new type of service and financial flows have to, um, to match that because any healthcare reform is only sustainable if you have payment reform with it. Uh, can we have a program on a behavioral communication on the community on this base? Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll probably add on to what James said. It's actually the health education and behavioral change in our population. It's a long time now, so our thought process have moved into that specialist care. They think, okay, if I have eye problem, I have to visit ophthalmologist. Otherwise, a general physician can't do anything. So we have to have some health education program. But, but to do that, first we have to establish well-functioning primary care setups which people can trust and go into. Yeah? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, speakers, for your excellent talk and interactive session from the audience. Thank you all. Thank you, dignitaries. Uh, for felicitation, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Prasanna from Department of Community Medicine, Lady Harding Medical College, New Delhi, to kindly felicitate Dr. Annapurna Singh. I request Dr. Suryakan Bali uh, from Ames Bhopal, Professor, Department of Community Medicine, to kindly come over the stage to felicitate Dr. Omesh Bharti. I request dignitaries to kindly come ahead for a group photograph. Thank you, speakers. Uh, we'll be short, uh, shortly uh, having the quiz competition in the auditorium only. So kindly be seated. Thank you. <laughs> 